We have it in our blood. We're crazy people. We're willing to die for our cause. Like, do you realize that? My original Armenian last name is actually Avedisian. Flying triangles that way. Um, I created a flying triangle by accident. And I think I got 60 in the first three months. Every tournament, every weekend, I'll just, boom. Flying triangle, flying triangle, flying triangles. It, it kind of like separated me from the whole pack. Political, I guess, that we can't really be friends because I trained Khabib for his fight and then he trained Connor. So you go to Wikipedia and type Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, it's literally my professor's pictures. Yeah, I would not have Armenian identity if I didn't go to Armenian school. I definitely would not be speaking Armenian. We have to put our children in Armenian schools. This is all a dream, honestly. I wasn't even supposed to be here. Homo told me this. He said, look, you want to be the best in the world? I'm sorry. Stop hanging out with your Armenian friends. Stop hanging out with everybody. Like, the only person you're going to hang out with is me. And the only thing you're going to do is train. I always love to see Armenians doing good in our sport. Edmund Shabazian, Arman Sarukian. Everyone has something to, to teach you, even if they're a white belt. Like, when I trained with Khabib, this guy was insane. He called me like, the first time I trained with him was like a, was like midnight. And he's like, can you train tomorrow 8 a.m. in Hollywood? And I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and then I get there and then this guy wants to train for one hour straight. I had to ask for a water break uh, <laughs> in between. He's crazy. Teaching like 40 year old men, like 40 year old men are looking at me as an example. Uh, you know, like old, like it just, it's calling me sensei. I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> we are crazy people. Our people were massacred and murdered for us just to be alive today. You know, we shouldn't even be here. So having that history and that blood, um, it, it makes us invincible. Holds me in the ice bath and, he, and he, he's like, look at me, Armenian genocide. Your people were massacred. You're a coward. How dare you come out, come out of this ice bath? This is nothing. And I just looked at him and I'm like, holy shit, you're kind of right. That's, so I stood in there for 20 minutes. My, my ancestors were, were like massacred and killed for me to be here today. And like, I'm a coward. I'm gonna give up in a match because I'm tired. Like, come on. My goal one day is, is to probably live in Armenia for some months of the year and uh, teach Jiu-Jitsu there and just help the community and the culture. Hello everyone, welcome to Zartonk Media. We're a new age independent Armenian multimedia news outlet. Today we have none other than a Jiu-Jitsu world champion with us in Edwin Najmi. Edwin, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me guys, appreciate it. Um, of course, uh, Edwin, let's start with your upbringing. Uh, tell us about your Armenian heritage and your background. Um, so my parents were born and raised in uh, Iran. Um, they moved to the United States when they were 20 years old, I believe. Um, a lot of people think I'm like half Armenian or not Armenian because of the Najmi last name. But um, my parents grew up in a Muslim um, dominant country and they had an Armenian last name. My original Armenian last name is actually Avedisian. Um, I put that one time on my Instagram and people started freaking out. Yo, you might be my cousin. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my parents had to add um, Najmi to the Armenian last name just to kind of blend in. And then uh, when my whole family moved to um, the United States, everybody else took Avedisian back. And my dad, I grew up in like boarding schools in England uh, before he came to the United States. I don't know, maybe he didn't want to be like singled out as being Armenian um, in a good or bad way. And he took Najmi. And yep, that's why I have Najmi last name. A lot of people, that's probably the number one question I get from Armenians like, like these three Armenian or, or, or why do you not have IAN? And uh, yeah, that's my, that's my history. Yeah, man, that sounds, sounds really good. Um, we're all here a product of Armenian schools. Um, so, and we're all from the same area. So yeah. what was it like going to an Armenian school, going to Armenian schools? And uh, what was that experience like for you? Um, Probably the greatest decision my parents ever ever made in their lives. Um, when we're young, we kind of take it for granted going to Armenian schools. We don't understand the friendship um, and the bonds you create and the culture you, you learn. Um, now that I'm older, I realize that literally, I would probably say 95% of my friends are, are my Armenian friends that, um, that I met through Armenian schools. Um, I was blessed. I wasn't blessed. I was a bad kid, but I was, I experienced two different Armenian schools. I went to AGB and, and Fedan, and I experienced the public school side of not going to Armenian school. So I know how it felt. Um, when I went to the public school um, in 10th grade, I literally didn't know anybody. And like, I, at that moment in my life, I realized um, I really love being Armenian. And I really like, 
I really bond with my Armenian friends and we really understand each other on a whole different level than other people. Um, I might be biased. Uh, we might all be biased because we're Armenian, but uh, Armenians, we, we're, we're different. You know, we really value like uh, family values, culture. Uh, we're, we're like, if you're my friend, like I'll die for you. So um, I didn't realize, I didn't really realize how blessed I was until I was older, but uh, I was truly blessed. Um, people ask me this all the time. If I went back, I would definitely put my kids in Armenian school. Um, the friendships and bonds you uh, create and, and um, in, in those times and those schools are, are, are priceless. So very blessed. Thank you to my parents for putting me through HVU. I'm so happy I went to Fedayan too, honestly. I created so many friendships at Fedayan. I was only there for one year, but uh, I was really happy uh, to go to both and create those friendships. My network is so big uh, today because of, the, of, of those two years. And yeah, man, I'm really lucky. Honestly, I would not have Armenian identity if I didn't go to Armenian school. I definitely would not be speaking Armenian, even though it's like pretty, my Armenian is not that good anymore, but uh, whatever it is, it'd be zero if I didn't go to Armenian school. So um, it's, it's definitely huge for us to continue growing and keeping our culture alive. Um, we have to put our children in Armenian schools and uh, keep the tradition alive. I mean, definitely. I mean, like both Bon and I went to Fedayan for all of high school, all of all of middle school, so we can definitely agree with that. Um, so we're going to shift on to your fighting career mm -hmm. right now. And um, um, your fighting career didn't start off with just jujitsu. You actually started off doing um, judo at Gokor Chibichan's um, dojo. Yeah. So what, what, like, what was it like le learning from him? And um, do you guys still keep in touch? Um, there's like a, there's like a, I want to say misconception, but a lot of people think I actually like directly trained with Gokor. Uh, whereas I actually trained my, I actually trained at like a karate dojo, um, which actually he teaches at a uh, Ferai now. High Couch Phil, I'm sure you guys have heard of him. So you, you, you guys know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so he was actually my first, that was the first dojo I ever trained at. So I trained at a karate dojo and then they had a guy named Vrej. He was the, um, grappling instructor from Gokor, like his prodigy, and he would teach us once a week. So I was literally training at this karate dojo, and I kind of like didn't like the karate or anything. I only liked the grappling, but they only offered it once a week. Um, and that was probably one of the hardest decisions of my life, looking back at 15 years old, um, especially with like an Armenian gym, like Armenian community, uh, making that decision to get out of my comfort zone and seek out more training. Um, that was probably one of the hardest, but the best decision I ever made in my life. Um, I actually got criticized from Armenians for leaving, leaving training with Armenians to train with Brazilians. Like I got a lot of hate for that. Um, I won't really talk about it, but um, they kind of called me a traitor and stuff. But um, uh, that's what made me who I am today. So uh, at 16, after one year of training at the Karate Dojo, I, I only like grappling. I walked into the random gym by Subway, um, happened to be one of the best of all time, Homul Bahal. Um, I thought they were lying to me. <laughs> I was like, no, there's no way there's a Brazilian world champion in Sino next to Subway. But uh, I, I got really lucky, man. And I was really mentored by one of the best ever. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia and type Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, it's literally my professor's picture. So um, Jiu Jitsu gave me a big outlet in life. Um, it gave me a, a purpose, a passion. Um, I, I think everybody in life searches for that. Some people die searching for that passion. Um, I was very lucky to find my passion and someone that could guide me um, through that art at, at such a young age. Um, I probably would be dead or in jail by now. I was a really bad kid. I got expelled from two schools at the age of 16 uh, because I hated school and I had no purpose or I had no reason to respect anybody. I don't know. I just, I, I was just trying to find something, something I was good at, uh, like an art. And uh, I found that in Jiu Jitsu and uh, it, I can really say it changed my life. Um, one day I'll, I will, I have a documentary. You can probably go talk to all the Fed Ion teachers and principals and AGB principals. Uh, they'll tell you how bad of a kid I was. So, and, and I'm proud of you. I'm not ashamed of it that uh, Jiu-Jitsu changed my life. And I'm here trying to help people um, with the art, um, trying to be a good person, you know? I, I wasn't the best kid, but uh, it just shows you that you can always change, turn things around. No, I'm glad you mentioned that because that like, segues into, into the next question. Um, Obviously, you joined Gracie Ba at 17. Um, your relationship with Homolu is special from, very special from what I've heard. Um, okay. Do you mind expanding on that a little bit and how you two kind of um, 
helped push each other, you know, to, to new heights, to greater heights. Yeah, definitely. Um, honestly, I just started jujitsu because um, I just kept with jujitsu because I wasn't good at anything else. Honestly, <laughs> I hated school. Um, I saw this guy that was just a monster, barely spoke English, honestly. Um, and my goal was always just to be kind of like become friends with him. Like he would never give me credit. He was like the hardest coach ever. He would always just like, he was so hard on me, you know, like I feel like probably 99% of people would, would have quit of, you know, with the circumstances I went through. He was just like, he just made me do more and more. And um, I don't know, just having someone um, in life, uh, role models usually are people you look up to, but they're not like real life examples. Um, you know, like you read about them, whatever you watch. Uh, I, I watch I'm watching Jordan. I'm inspired by him. But like, this is like, this is the craziest thing because I had a role model, but I was seeing this guy in his prime and I was seeing him every day put this work in. So that, that like, you know, being around a champion of that caliber and not even realizing it um, at the time, it, it was just, it was the craziest experience ever. And he used to always tell me, man, cherish these, cherish these moments, cherish these moments, train with me every day. Like you're going to, you're going to talk about this one day. And uh, it's so crazy. Honestly, I was like a stupid little white belt. And then I ended up becoming like his first white to black belt. Um, ended up becoming his business partner at Gracie Ball Tarzana. Um, so this is all a dream, honestly. I wasn't even supposed to be here, but um, hard work and work ethic, consistency uh, can get you anywhere, man. Just just keep working hard, keep believing, and um, yeah, man, just find a passion. Uh, you talked about hard work, consistency. Uh, I mean, I, I read that he made you like practice your spider guard for, for months on yeah. end. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your training regimen? Because, uh, you know, a lot of people want to be the best, but they don't want to put the work in. They're infatuated with getting to the destination, but they're not as passionate about the journey, the sacrifices you need to make. Definitely. So can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Um, especially with social media now these days, like everybody's like, oh yeah, I want to be the best, but they just, they really don't know what it takes. Um, I would say I probably train eight hours every single day for uh, probably the first like six to seven years of my jiu-jitsu career. Uh, I basically did nothing else after like 10th grade, I would say, until like 24 years old. I The hardest decision I ever made in my life, Homo told me this. He said, look, you want to be the best in the world? I'm sorry. Stop hanging out with your Armenian friends. Stop hanging out with everybody. Like the only person you're going to hang out with is me. And the only thing you're going to do is train. So I literally, I went from being like a popular kid in 10th, 11th grade, whatever. You know, like everyone likes like the bad kid. He's a fighter or whatever. And I literally stopped hanging out with all my friends, nothing. I didn't go to a single party, anything for like six, seven years straight. And all I did was grind every day. And now that I look back, it probably wasn't the best thing for my mental health because I was a psychopath and all I trained. But uh, that kind of extreme uh, sacrifice and dedication is uh, what it takes to even have a chance to be the best. So um, I definitely learned that um, hard work, dedication, uh, just focus, I would say more focus. When your goal is uh, only one thing and one thing only, like my goal was only to be the best. My goal was only to be uh, a good black belt, a respected black belt. And uh, when you dedicate yourself to that every single day for five to 10 years, um, you're going to have a chance to do it. You still might not do it. I have a lot of friends that they, they, they were on the same journey as me and they quit just to, or they, or they, were, they didn't make it. Um, that's just the unfortunate part about sports. Um, and, just that's just the unfortunate part unfortunate part about any achieving anything great um you might sacrifice anything to be great and you might not be great uh, it sucks it's shitty but uh that's just how life works and to even have a chance um you got to be 100 percent focused and dedicated and uh now that i get as you get older you, you just you know you just uh learn a lot and um i just look back and i feel like i'd be a great coach today with all the experiences i had today i, I wish i even i was even more dedicated and, and more focused um I'm still not done. I have a lot of years left in me, but uh, yeah, crazy journey. Yeah, man, I mean, um, almost anyone who has ever gotten somewhere has always sacrificed um, up to five to 10 years of their life because it's not s something easy. Definitely. But segueing um, into the next question, your go-to submission um, is the triangle choke and you're, no and you're known for the flying triangle. So what's it like to have a move associated with you? <laughs> um, you know, like my goal always in jujitsu, I, I always had a crazy style. And I mean, if you ever met me, I'm, all, I'm a unique person. I'm like different. So uh, I guess like my personality kind of uh, influenced my jujitsu in that way. 
Um, it felt good, man. Uh, when you're when you're when you're uh, an Armenian, or even Armenian is even like the hardest. But let's just say non-Brazilian in a Brazilian dominant sport. I'm talking like 95% of the medals, not even just the gold medals. All medals go to Brazilians. It's really hard to get in the community. They they really don't show respect to uh, um, non-Brazilians. So um, I had to find a way to kind of like create my brand and just kind of break through and make my presence known. So um, flying triangles that way. Um, I created flying triangle by accident. And then uh, the, sec- the day I did it in training, um, I did it that weekend at a tournament three times. Then after that weekend, I like looked at my coach and I was like, yo, I think I just like discovered something crazy. I was only a purple belt. I wasn't even that good. Um, I remember just talking about it and I was like, all right, I'm, I'm just going to keep it really, really low key. And I'm just going to try to do this like every tournament for the first five months. And then I think I got 60 in the first three months, every tournament, every weekend, I'll just boom. Flying triangle, flying triangle, flying triangle. So that definitely helped me establish like my presence in the sport and uh, just create a brand, you know, for, for, for people. It, it kind of like separated me from the whole pack. I was like an average, I was an average competitor. Like I was good, but it's really hard to break through from this like average pack. And that really elevated me to a whole different level. And uh, now like I get tagged in videos like 30 times a day. Yo, bro, check out my flying triangle. So it feels good. Uh, my goal was always to uh, just make a mark on the sport. Um, I still have a lot more to do, but that was definitely a really good starting point. Um, being, I'm not the creator of the Flying Triangle because a lot of people have, have done it before me, but uh, I've definitely done it like a hundred more times than anybody else. So I'll call myself the creator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, so do you mind telling us about your uh, mission submission uh, DVD? Um, yeah, I, I just came out with an instructional, um, to show my favorite submissions. Uh, my mission is always the submission. Um, a lot of people in Jiu Jitsu, um, have a tendency to just fight to win and just do whatever it takes. Like Jiu Jitsu is, is not a spectator friendly sport because everyone's so scared to lose and they literally fight for like one grip or one stupid little point to win. And, um, my goal has, and my goal and philosophy has always been for jiu to be mainstream because I'm not even thinking about myself. Thinking about jiu to be mainstream, you got to be exciting, man. Like, you got to go for submission. You got you to go for a kill. Like, you guys wouldn't be talking to me today if I, if I fought to win every match by points. People only know me because I, I fight to kill. I fight, I fight to submit. And um, basically, my, my DVD just covers that. I show my favorite submissions. Just trying to help the next generation. I, I, I get questions all the time. Like, what's your advice? And all this, and uh, and I tell everybody, you're not any sports athlete is not an you're you are an athlete, but you, before an athlete, you're an entertainer. Like people have to realize this. When you, you're an, you're an entertainer. You're putting on a show. Think about it, you're on, you're on a stage. Um, once uh, once once athletes understand that, I believe it becomes a lot better, a lot easier to elevate your brand and uh, put on a show for the fans. So. That's something I always think about and uh, try to help the, the next generation with. Put on a show. Be exciting. Um, okay. Dylan Danis is a huge name in the jiu-jitsu world. Uh, he's also Armenian. Can you <clears throat> yeah. tell us about the time you two competed and uh, do you guys still keep in touch being two Armenian phenoms in the industry? Yeah. Um, Dylan's actually one of my good friends. Um, it just kind of like political I guess that we can't really be friends because I trained Khabib for his fight and then he trained Connor so there was like beef between the camps um, but Dylan's always been my friend last time I was in New York we hung out I took a picture we were both like flicking off the camera but I can't post that because I'll, I'll, the internet will break probably if I posted that but um, yeah he's a good friend man uh, when I fought him he was like a pretty seasoned black ball already he was my first black ball tournament so it was hard to like fight at that level um, would love to maybe compete against him one day soon, but, uh, I consider him a friend, um, even though like we can't really hang out that, that much or train because the political ties in jiu-jitsu, but, uh, Dylan's the homie. Um, I always get on him. I was like, yo, bro, come on. At least learn a couple words of Armenian. Come on. At least bada means pesta something. Come on. You know, you, you can't rep Armenian if you don't know at least a couple words. So I always get on, get on him for that. But, um, yeah, he's definitely very controversial. Um, not the, not the not the path that I would like to take for my career. I like to be loved by everybody. I don't know how he sleeps at night. Sometimes I, I joke with him. I'm like, yo man, the whole world hates you. How do you sleep at night? But he loves it. And, 
yeah, and he feels him. So my hat's off to him. Another solid Armenian. I always love to see Armenians doing good in our sport. Um, we got a couple of MMA fighters now that are doing really good as well. Edmund Shabazian, Armand Sarukian, those guys. So um, always reaching out to help those guys and uh, always good to see Armenians doing well. Yeah, um, perfect. Um, who, in your opinion, is at the top of the jiu-jitsu world right now? And uh, who is your hardest match against? Um, jiu-jitsu is such a crazy sport. It's like tennis. So there's so many good guys. So it'd be hard to single out uh, one guy. I mean, there's always like the, like the household names. There's Bouchesha, um, Gordon Ryan, Felipe Pena, Andre Galval. There's, 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 so, there's so many good guys in jiu-jitsu. That's why no one in jiu-jitsu is undefeated. Like when people ask you, they don't know much about jiu-jitsu and they ask me, they're like, hey, what's your record, man? Are you undefeated? I'm like, no, like I've had like a thousand matches. No, no one's undefeated in jiu-jitsu because the level is so high and the gap is so close that you're always going to lose and win in jiu-jitsu. So um, I would say the hardest match I've ever had was my first year at Black Belt. Um, I fought a guy named Lucas Lepre. He's a 10-time world champion and he was a Black Belt world champion uh, before I even started training. So, um, yeah, that was the hardest match I ever had. Uh, my first year at Black Bull, I made it to the World Championship Final. Wasn't planning on doing so. And then I saw myself, like, across, like, the GOAT. <laughs> and I got smacked pretty bad. But um, that, was a, that was a crazy learning experience at 22 years old, being a Black Bull in the World Championship Final, looking at the screen, being ranked, like, 258, and this guy's ranked number one. Um, that was, a, that was definitely, uh, an, a crazy experience. And that kind of like made me realize like, yo, you're here. This is the guy I've been watching on YouTube for 10 years, but now you got to beat this guy. So, uh, sports is crazy. You, you grow up, um, idolizing your idols, watching them on YouTube every day, trying to copy their moves, trying to be like them. And then like literally a blink of the eye later, you're, you're, you're fighting them. So I think that's the hardest part about sports. You see it in like basketball all the time. These college kids come to the NBA and, and they get kind of like, you know, like, like these guys, the NBA players treat them like, like, like they're their dad. So that's how I felt my first year of Black Bowl. Um, Going back to the, the Connor Khabib, you and Dylan Danis uh, mm -hmm. thing, we, we saw that picture on, on Instagram that you posted with Khabib. Yeah. Um, how was, how was training uh, with him, with someone of his caliber? And uh, have you trained with other professional fighters? Um, definitely. Yeah. Um, I've honestly turned down training with a lot of fighters because it affects my own training. But uh, I've, I've trained with Khabib um, a lot of times. Uh, Rafael Lozanjos, he was the UFC lightweight champion for a while. He's actually one of my really good friends. I consider him my older brother. Um, you name it, man. Uh, I'm really good friends with Ali Abdulaziz, Khabib's manager. Um, he's the one that has beef for everybody. He's always throwing jabs at Dylan. But um, he always calls me to, to train all these fighters. Um, he actually just called me for this weekend to train Justin Gaethje for the Tony Ferguson fight. But um, I don't know. I thought that'd be like a selfish act and all my students would hate me for flying to Denver to train with him while they can't train at my gym. So I had to turn that down. But um, it's good, man. It's always good to be around these champions. Um, just learn from them. Uh, when I was younger, I wasn't so good at like, uh, you know, like taking information from these champions. But now I feel like I'm better. You know, I hang out with them. I, I take a habit from him. I take a trait from him, a technique from him. So always trying to learn, always trying to evolve. Everyone has something to, to teach you. Even if they're a white belt, if they have a cool technique, I'll always be there to, to listen. So, um, but more so the champions, it's just a work ethic. You know, like when I trained with Khabib, this guy was insane. He called me like, the first time I trained with him was like, a, was like midnight. And he's like, can you train tomorrow 8 a.m. in Hollywood? And I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and then I get there and then this guy wants to train for one hour straight. I had to ask for a water break uh, <laughs> in between. He's crazy um but yeah man it was a really good training um i truly believe i helped him a lot for that style unfortunately that fight fell through six times the tony ferguson fight um but we'll see maybe i'll be back training with him for the seventh time going off that have have you entertained the idea of maybe pivoting into the mma world at all um yeah it's crazy i literally just started training i, I didn't know what jiu-jitsu was i didn't know what a gi was i didn't know any of this i only started training to fight mma i loved mma like that was always my goal i wanted to be a fighter um but then i kind of fell in love with the martial arts aspect of you know jiu-jitsu respect uh loyalty um i really fell in love with that and um yeah i haven't fought and i'm 27 now it's kind of crazy but um i think about it all the time um 
So I started out my career, I really wanted to fight. And then from like, probably like 19 to like 26, 27, I was like, no, I'm never going to fight. I'm going to fight for fun maybe one time, but I, I really love my brain cells. I have a lot of friends. I mean, I've trained, good, I've trained great fighters, but I've trained with a lot of guys that were average fighters too. And these guys have brain damage. Like it's, it's, it's a serious thing. Like um, I have friends that are like 30 and they, they slur their speech. Uh, they can't talk. Um, I talk really fast. So if, if I say, you, if I think you're not talking correctly, then you're, you're not at all. You're really messed up. So that kind of scared me. Um, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. Um, I definitely want to fight. Um, I'm thinking I'm just going to fight until I get knocked out or hopefully I won't get knocked out and I'll retire 10 and 0. My goal is 10 and 0. So uh, maybe, um, to be honest, the more I train with more of these fighters, the more I gain confidence in myself. And I'm like, man, like I just trained with that guy and his jiu-jitsu is really bad, you know. Um, I can easily do that too. But uh, I know it's a different beast in there getting, getting some, with someone trying to take your head off. But uh, I would love to fight. Um, I really think um, during this quarantine, I've been thinking about it a lot. And uh, I think I might give it a shot. So we'll see. Um, yeah. <laughs> we'll see we'll see we'll see what happens but uh i think to elevate elevate my brand and to have like more influence uh like you know try to really put armenians out there i, I need to fight i think I, i'm looking at it that way so i might have to do it yeah man that that sounds really good and we're, and we're all looking forward to that whenever that happens <laughs> um um you re you recently opened up your own place in the encino tarzan area um so what does it mean um to you to have your own place at the, like from the age of 26? Um, it's probably the craziest feeling in the world. Uh, my whole life changed, my whole perspective changed on life. I went from just being dedicated and focused on one thing, winning, uh, being selfish, you know, to be a champion, to be even a contender, you need to be selfish every day to being uh, a teacher, you know, trying to help people. Um, teaching is something where, I never really thought I would enjoy. Um, my business partner just came out, came up with this business idea to open a gym in Tarzana. And I was like, yeah, it's a great idea. Let's just do it. Um, cool. We'll just, we'll just figure it out. You know, I'll train and teach once a day. Uh, but as I started getting students and then like teaching people from like day one, like you, I, I don't think about this and you don't think about this, but people don't know anything, you know, they don't know anything. You learn so much in your first month of jujitsu. So um, teaching these people, teaching like 40 year old men, like 40 year old men are looking at me as an example, uh, you know, like old, like it just, it's calling me sensei. I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> I'm a little kid, you know, I'm a kid, you know, I, I still look, at, look at myself as a kid, but having that responsibility to like help people every day and teach them as a teacher, it's crazy. You know, it just makes me really grateful. Um, just, just, just change, just change my whole life. Honestly, in the past nine months, made me such a better person. Um, every day I walk in the gym, uh, no matter how shitty I'm feeling or, or if I'm in a bad attitude, I have to flip that switch and uh, just uh, be ready to teach and uh, help people. So um, it definitely changed my life a lot. Um, I would say it kind of negatively affected my competitions in the past seven, eight months because I didn't have that killer instinct and that like 100% focus. Um, but um, I think I'm slowly trying to, I'm slowly figuring out the transition and the balance and I think to truly be a great champion, a martial artist and a person, that balance is key because uh, being selfish and being just dedicated to one craft and only winning is really good to win. But um, as like a person, as for your legacy and all that, um, it's not good. So I think it's the best decision I ever made in my life. Uh, I've already made so many friendships and bonds and like it, it's just a brotherhood, you know, Jiu Jitsu is different. It's just like, the locker room, the brotherhood, the family you created, it's, it's truly special. And uh, you can't really, um, can't really, um, I can't really explain it until you try it. But uh, I promise you, if you ever tried a jiu-jitsu class, you probably would, you would come back. So it's just a true bond. It's a different bond you create with uh, students. And uh, now I want to create my own Edwins, you know, like well, how Homo will mentor me since the beginning. Like, I see kids like looking up to me and uh, I want to do that. So uh, it's nice. It kind of just, makes me think about the future. Um, you know, uh, the martial arts are, it's tough, um, but Armenians have put out consistently some of the top martial artists. <laughs> you, if you yeah. look at guys like 
Giorgio Petrosian, you know, in Muay Thai. Uh, he's the doctor. He's like the Floyd Mayweather of, of Muay Thai. To Gegard Musasi, to in Greco-Roman wrestling, Arthur Alexanian, to, like you said, Edmund Shabazian, Armand Sarukian, the Fight Club Lionheart in Moscow, which is like one of the most dominant fight clubs. Uh, why do you think Armenians are so good at fighting in the martial arts? Um, we have it in our blood. We're crazy people. We're willing to die for our cause. Like, do you realize that? Like, if you ask probably 90% of Armenians, would you give your life for the Armenian genocide to be recognized? They'd probably say yes. You know, I would say yes. So we're, we're, we are crazy people. Our people were massacred and murdered for us just to be alive today. You know, we shouldn't even be here. So having that history and that blood, um, it, it makes us invincible. We have mental strength. We have like dark, we have dark, we have deep uh, places in our brain and our mind that we can go that other people can't, you know? Um, I didn't really think about this until I was a purple belt actually. This is probably the, the day where my career changed. My whole life, my, my mental aspect and my mental training, I just took it to a whole nother level. So our wrestling coach this day, I was probably 20 years old. Uh, we finished wrestling practice. I'm dead. Four-hour wrestling practice. This guy has a 30-degree ice bath, okay? None of these champions are going in there. There's Homo. Homo's the only guy that's going there, but he's like the craziest guy I know. There's like, I'm not going to say names, but the greatest, the greatest jiu-jitsu athlete of all time can't sit in this ice bath for 30 seconds. It's 30 degrees. It's freezing. You're going to have a heart attack if you sit in there. Everyone's trying to do this ice bath. No one can. I'm like, all right, I'm going to try this. Let me hop in here. Everyone's hopping out. So I sit in this ice bath. 30 degrees. I'm literally about to have a heart attack. I'm like trying to get out. And this wrestling coach like shoves me in there. Oh, shit. <laughs> shoves me in the ice bath. Holds me in the ice bath. And, he, and he, he's like, look at me. Armenian genocide. Your people were massacred. You're a coward. How dare you get out, come out of this ice bath? This is nothing. And I just looked at him and I'm like, holy shit. You're kind of right. That's, that, 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 that's a crazy way to look at it. But you're kind, of, you're kind of right. So I stood in there for 20 minutes. 20 minutes I stood in the ice bath. I, I became numb. And that day, I just unlocked like this crazy, dark, deep part of my mind where I could push my body to a whole nother level. And I think about it all the time. When I'm like running or I'm in a competition and I'm in a really bad spot, I always think about that. I'm like, my, my ancestors were, were like massacred and killed for me to be here today. And like, I'm a coward. I'm gonna give up in a match because I'm tired. Like, come on, you know, push yourself to that new level. So I think we have that history. And, and uh, if you can relate yourself to that history and, and the history of your people, that's going to push your mind to, to a whole new level. You, you didn't even think that was possible. So, yeah, that's why we are, that's why we're tough, tough people because our history is unparalleled. I don't think any other race can even compare it to our history. Um, you... Speaking about Armenia and the Armenian genocide, uh, you went to Armenia recently in 2016. Um, mm -hmm. You, if I recall correctly, it was with AJ Agazarm as well. Um, yeah, I went there in 2016 and 2018. Okay, in 2018. Um, how was that experience like? Uh, did you, you, you said you left Armenian school prior to the Armenia trip, right? So was yeah. that 2016 experience your first time in Armenia? Yeah. Um, that, that experience was kind of crazy because uh, that was the moment where I realized my Armenian was lacking. <laughs> my, Armenian, my Armenian used to be really good and I thought it was still good until I had to do an interview in Armenian and I was like, wow, my Armenian is really bad. So um, I, I, th I feel like that really helped me reconnect to my roots. Uh, I made it my goal to really speak Armenian every day and uh, practice my Armenian every day. Um, when I first went there, there was like, probably seven to eight students at BG Armenia. It was a random guy on Facebook that found me. He's like, yo, brother, can you please come? Yeah, I went there. They didn't know anything. Um, they didn't even have uniforms. And after that day, I made it my goal to help them out there. And I think I've probably sent like maybe a hundred geese every year since then, uniforms to them and help them grow. And I believe we're at maybe 80 to a hundred students now in Armenia. The last time I went there, I had like 50 people at my seminar. Everyone's wearing uniforms. Everyone's learning jujitsu. Uh, they got me and Bushesh's picture on the wall, on the back. So it's amazing, you know, just, just to um, help them out and uh, teach them jujitsu. It's, it's, it's incredible. Honestly, I, I, that's probably the thing I'm most proud about. Um, I love being there. Honestly, my goal one day is, is to probably live in Armenia for some months of the year and uh, teach jujitsu there and just 
help the community and the culture. Um, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, it's awesome that like you give back and, you know, like sending geese and little things like that. It matters because a lot yeah. of those kids, uh, you know, some of them are underprivileged or that means the world to have facilities and uh, equipment to help them kind of do what they want. Um, how familiar are you with the jujitsu scene in Armenia? Is it, is it, are there, there's like a real grappling club as well, right? Is that the same? Um, what's, what's the scene like there? Um, yeah, it's the same guy. So it's Ruben Miribian and Andre uh, Arutunyan. It's two guys. They're like my really good friends now. They're like, I consider them like family now, like my uncles. And um, that's basically the only gym in Armenia. And yeah, I'm pretty close to them. I try to help them as much as they can. I send videos all the time. Uh, when I was in Armenia for two weeks, I taught a free class every single day. So I try to give like as much as I can. The scene is great. Um, the thing with jiu-jitsu is jiu-jitsu is such a, like a non-ego sport, you know, and Armenians, we tend to have ego when it comes to, to sports, right? We're like very hard-headed, like, you know, like hop headed people. We always want to win. And jiu-jitsu, you always lose. So like instilling that mentality in Armenians in Armenia definitely took a couple of years, but um, it's great to see it growing. Like I said, like last time I was there, there was 50 people there training, like with modern jiu-jitsu, not just like random techniques, actually good jiu-jitsu. And uh, they're doing an amazing job, honestly. They deserve a lot of credit. Um, jiu-jitsu is growing. And hopefully soon we'll have multiple academies, maybe hundreds of students there. But uh, jiu-jitsu is definitely getting like more, more respect in the community because uh, I would say martial arts in Armenia was probably dominated by judo and uh, boxing in the past like 100 years. But jiu-jitsu is getting uh, a little more credit. Uh, and last time I was there, um, I actually trained like the secret forces. I don't know what they call it, but yeah, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to document it or anything, but, uh, they gave me a t-shirt, but yeah, I was like blindfolded, but yeah, I trained those guys, you know, you know, the guys that go, you know, with, with the uniforms and the, and they like ransack people on the news. Yeah. Those crazy guys, like the secret forces, I trained them. They were, they were really, really cool. And they, they had a lot of knowledge, which surprised me. And then they let me shoot a couple guns after. So that was a really cool experience as well. I don't know if I was supposed to talk about that. Sorry if I wasn't, but that was a really cool experience training the, I guess the Armenian KGB, they call it. That, that, that was a crazy experience. That sounds really interesting. Sounds really yeah. fun. Uh, um, what's next for Edwin Ajmi? Um, just keep training, keep fighting, growing, growing academies. Uh, my goal is to have probably five, six academies. Uh, in the Los Angeles area. I honestly eventually want to have my own academy in Armenia, um, whether we transition that BJJ Armenia to like some kind of affiliation with myself, but I, I definitely want to have some kind of like something in Armenia, you know, like I think that's going to make me feel really good. So that's my goal. Um, keep inspiring youth, keep setting a good example. Um, I may not be the most professional um, example, like some of these guys are a lot more straightforward, but uh, I think I'm a good example because I'm just like another kid. Like you can relate to me. Um, I'm not here. I cuss. I dress like you kids. Like I'm, I'm literally one of you guys. So I'm just trying to set an example. You, you can be yourself. You don't need to act all professional and then be a good example. You don't need to be all like straightforward and like in a suit and all this stuff. You can still set a good example and be yourself. So that's just me, you know, being yourself, chase your dreams connect to your Armenian people. That's really important. I think a lot of Armenian kids think it's like cool um, not to be Armenian. You know, they kind of like make fun of like our kids that are like really like pro Armenian and like Armenian rights. But uh, yeah, that's not right. Because if we do that in like 20, 30 years, there's going to be no Armenian language or culture. So stay to your roots, you know, support the people. Like I saw you guys on Instagram, probably when you guys had like a thousand followers, I think you guys had nothing. And I was like, yo, this is really cool, clean. I'm going to support these guys. They're doing good work. So, yeah, man, just trying to expand the network, help the people, and uh, build a brand. No, that's awesome, man. Uh, best of luck to you. Uh, if anyone in our viewership is interested in jiu-jitsu, lives in L.A., make sure you guys sign up and join Gracie Bala Tarzana to learn from the best. Um, Edwin, thank you for coming on. Thank best you, Best of luck. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you, guys.